Part 1. The First Age. Chapter 2. Narnichin Hurin. The Tale of the Children of Hurin. Part 3. Section 7. The Return of Turin to Dorlomin. Okay, so we're out of the appendix now and back to the main section of the story. Turin has been running and running all the way past the Pool of Ivrin, where Tur and Voronwe see him, remember that? And he finally enters the land of Dorlomin for the first time in 23 years. And it's a terrible winter. He goes through the snow to his old home, only to find everyone gone. Brada, the Easterling, lives close by, and he was the one who plundered the house after Morwen and Neonor left for Doriath. Turin goes to Brada's house, and he's granted some shelter among the servants and traveling beggars. This is because of Irene's generosity, not Brada's. Remember, Irene is a kinswoman of Hurin who was taken by Brada, as against her will. Anyway, uh, Turin gets news from one of the beggars that Morwen and Neonor have already been gone for a while now, and that all the people of Hador are either dead, begging, or enslaved. And it turns out that the guy who Turin has been talking to is Sador! Aww! And Turin asks him where his family went, but Sador doesn't know, instead telling him that Irene might know. So, Turin bursts into the great hall and marches right up to Brada's table where he and Irene are sitting, with a bunch of other Easterlings standing around. And he reveals his identity and demands that Irene tell him where his mother and sister went. So she tells him the truth. Then Turin realizes that Glaurung lied to him. Surprise, surprise. And, of course, Brada is, needless to say, angry, and he insults Morwen. So, in a wild rage, Turin throws him across the table, and when he lands, he breaks his neck. Then there's a huge brawl among the Easterlings and the servants who are of the House of Hador. And it's, it's just pandemonium, and Sador dies in the fight, and Irene says to Turin, Oh, thanks a lot. Now the other Easterlings are gonna kill me. You're acting like the child I remember you to be. And Turin says, yeah, well, you're just as faint-hearted as ever, but come on, let's go find my mother together. But she replies, nope, I am too old to go into the wild, but you need to get out of here. You've caused enough trouble. And he leaves with a bunch of the people of Hador who were involved in the brawl. And they escape the Easterlings because the falling snow covers their tracks. And when Turin looks back and sees a glowing light far off, one of the guys tells him, Irene had the hall set on fire. Her heart was not faint. Section 8. The Coming of Turin into Brethil So Turin parts ways with the remaining men who ran away with him, and he heads on alone further south. He is definitely comforted by the fact that Morwen and Neonor are safe in Doriath, and it's all because of him keeping the land temporarily orc-free during his time in Nargothrond. And he, so now he figures he'll just let them be because he's finally realizing that he's kind of like a bad luck charm wherever he goes. So, but he's now desperate to find Finduilas, remember? And, and while he wanders around trying to find her, he comes across some of the people of Haleth in Brethil, and they're currently being surrounded by a bunch of orcs. So, he jumps out and yells behind him as if he is, has a whole group of men with him, like he's calling out behind him. And this, the orcs fall for this trick, and once they see his famous black sword, oh, they fall for it and, and they panic. And then Turin and the men give chase and kill most of them. And the men are really impressed, so they invite him to come and live with him. But he says he's looking for someone, and he asks if they've seen Finduilas. And they look at him, and they feel sorry for him, because their leader, Dorlas, says, Well, when we attacked that ore coast that held the prisoners, they started killing all the women, and they pinned Finduilas to a tree with a spear. We actually buried her near the crossings of Teglin. That was a month ago. So they take him to her grave, and he falls down on it in grief, which casts a sort of dark sickness over him. And it's at that moment that Dorlas realizes Turin is the Black Sword of Nargothrond. Famous, right? So they bring him, with re great reverence, to Amon Obel, where the main settlement of the Haladin is. And they bring him to their leader, Brandir, son of Handir, 
as you know, Brandir's leg is disabled, and personality-wise, he's not a warlike individual. Instead, he prefers, you know, the woods and things that grow rather, rather than metal, and he's really good at healing, okay? Now, the minute he sees Turin's face, he, he kind of freaks out and goes, why didn't you guys just kill him? He's going to be the bane of our people. I, I just know it. And the men are like, oh, calm down. It's just the black sword of Nargothron. He's all right. And Brandir's like, I don't like the looks of this. But since he's a healer, he, uh, you know, he heals Turin of his dark sickness. And uh, when Turin awakes... He decides to renounce his name and kin, and in doing so, attempt to avoid his dark doom. So now he calls himself Turambar, Master of Doom, or rather Fate. And the people of Brethil, well, they think he's just great. Indeed, he fights orcs quite aggressively, but Brandir is not so keen on him because since he wants to keep his people safe and secret in the forest, that means they need to keep a lower profile. He doesn't want Morgoth to find out what a f that a famous orc slayer like Turin is living there now. So Turin lays aside his sword so he won't be recognized by it, and he s instead he just takes up a bow and spear. And he guards the grave of Finduilas so orcs fear to go there. But his fearsome personality? Of course, it hasn't gone away. And Dorlas says to him, You know, you're still the Black Sword, even though you don't go by that name anymore. And I've heard rumors that the Black Sword is actually Turin, son of Hurin. Is that true? And Turin's like, hey, hey, not so loud. Don't announce it to everybody. Section 9. The Journey of Morwen and Nienor to Nargothrond. So, meanwhile, some elves have been able to escape the sack of Nargothrond, and they come into Doriath. And they say that the famed Black Sword is indeed Turin, son of Hurin. But they're not 100% sure what happened to him. Is he dead? Is he alive? Who knows? Now, of course, this greatly upsets Morwen, but Thingol figures that Turin is kind of beyond any hope of rescue. So he tells her not to do anything rash, because all this doubt is probably the work of Morgoth. But Morwen argues with him and with Melian, saying that she will not stay just for fear of Morgoth. And then she goes and tells Neonor that she's going after Turin. So the next morning she rides off. But this really worries Thingol, so he sends out a group of riders headed by Mablung. He tells them to watch over her, and he tells Mablung to gather as much information as he can about the fates of Nargothrond and of Turin. So the group sets out and catches up to her when she comes to Sirion, because she doesn't really know the way to cross. And Morwen's like, oh, did Thingol send you to stop me, or has he given me help like I asked for? And Mablung says, well, both. So he tries to get her to come back, and of course she refuses, so the group guides her safely across the river. And as they come across in the morning mist, Morwen notices an extra person there. Hey, it's Neonor! Ah, oh, she snuck in with the group. And Morwen tries to get her to go back to Doriath, but Neonor refuses, instead saying that she will go wherever Morwen goes. She was actually kind of hoping to get Morwen to come back with her, and now Morwen is torn, but her stubborn pride eventually wins out and forces her to keep going west. So Neonor goes with her. And Mablung says to the other elves, Oh my god, this family is impossible. So the band makes their way into the realm of Nargothrond, but the land is desolate and eerie. And Mablung has a bad feeling about it, so he urges Morwen to turn around. He gets frustrated when she refuses and tells her that he'll lead her to the top of Amun Ethir and keep her guarded there without going anywhere else. Now, a long time ago, Finrod had this hill built up. It's, artif it's an artificial hill. It's covered with trees except for the very top, and it gives a good view, a nice far view of the surrounding land. So the next day, Mablung takes some scouts to scope out the place, leaving Morwen and Neonor on the hill with some guards. And they see the evidence of the sack, but they don't see the dragon. However, Glaurung has been watching them the entire time, and he knows there are still people up on the hill. So he bursts forth with a huge flame, causing giant vapors to rise out of the river. Then he himself sneaks across. And meanwhile, everyone in the company scatters, but Mablung hides under a rock because he still is determined to find out the fate of Turin. 
He plans to go inside the halls to look for any clues to his whereabouts. Now the watchers on the hill see Glaurung heading towards them, so they urge Morwen and Neonor to re retreat immediately. But just then, the reeking vapors reach them, and the horses go nuts, running this way and that. Morwen loses control of her horse, and it carries her away into the mists, and Neonor's horse throws her from it. And when she gets up, she's completely alone. So she decides to climb to the top of the hill where the vapors haven't been able to reach. Seems reasonable, right? But when she climbs the hill and looks westward, she finds herself suddenly staring into the evil eyes of Glaurung. And they were terrible, being filled with the fell spirit of Morgoth and his master. And he is able to overpower her and find out... He finds out that she's looking for Turin. He then hypnotizes her into an empty darkness, giving her amnesia, blindness, and deafness. She knew nothing, and heard nothing, and remembered nothing. And in the meantime, Mablung explores the empty halls of Nargothron, but of course he doesn't find anything. And when he comes out again, he sees Glaurung coming back over the river. At first, the dragon doesn't notice him, so Mablung just kind of sits back and watches, but then Glaurung turns around and mockingly says to the elf, Go to the hill. See what's happened to the person you were supposed to take care of. <laughs> and he slithers back into the halls. So Mablung discovers Neonor standing like a statue on top of the hill. She can't hear anything he says, and he's only able to lead her around by the hand. All the horses have gone, so he slowly takes her down into the plain. And it's really rough going, and at one point, she just kind of stumbles and falls, and Mablung just, ugh, he sits right down next to her in total despair, saying, I knew this errand was a bad idea, we're gonna die out here, and everyone back in Doriath is just gonna remember me with scorn, like I failed my mission, you know? But just then, three of the original group members happen upon them. Ah, oh, good. And they all head towards Doriath. It takes many days because they have to lead Neonor slowly. And just as they get to the border, they rest from utter weariness and exhaustion. But they're also not paying close attention. So a bunch of orcs suddenly happen upon them. And Neonor just freaks out and starts running wildly through the forest, and the orcs are chasing her, and the elves are chasing the orcs. She disappears. She's running so quickly, she outruns the elves. Now, the elves catch up to the orcs and kill them. Then they try to run after her, but, I mean, she's gone. Uh, so the, the elves finally return to Doriath, and Mablung, you know, he feels terrible because he failed in his promise to Thingol to watch over Morwen and Neonor. But Melian reassures him that it really wasn't his fault, and that they're all dealing with a power far greater than anyone now living in Middle-earth. Nevertheless, Mablung still feels responsibility, so he sets out with a small company that travels the land, seeking tidings of those who are lost. Section 10. Neonor in Brethil. So Neonor is just running, running, running. She tears her clothes off, just in a frenzy like a wild animal. It's only in the evening when her madness passes and she lies down to sleep. And when she wakes up, she's able to see and hear again, but she has no memory of her past. It just seems like a hazy darkness. So she crosses over Theglin into Brethil, and when night falls again, she lies down on a green mound. And then a storm suddenly comes, and the lightning frightens her a lot. But, just then, a small group of men, led by Turin, sees her in the lightning. At first, she looks scary to them, for it seemed that he saw the wraith of a slain maiden that lay upon the grave of Finduilas. Because the very mound Neonor is lying on is, in fact, Finduilas's grave. But once they all realize she's actually alive, Turin picks her up, covers her in a blanket, and they all go to a nearby hunting lodge. And when she sees Turin's face in the firelight, she's suddenly comforted, though she doesn't really know why. And when he asks her what her name is, she starts to weep. So he says that for now, he'll just call her Niniel, Maid of Tears. She looks at him and shakes her head when she hears the name, but then she says the name out loud, her first word since the dragon's spell. 
So the next day, they take her past a misty waterfall that leads to the fort on Amon Obel, and the cold water causes her to shudder. So from that day on, the place is named Nengirith, the shuddering water. Unfortunately, it gives her chills and a fever, so once they take her to the fort, Brandir takes care of her and heals her, and the wives of the woodmen watch over her. But she only ever seems to be at peace when Turin is near her, and over time she learns how to speak again, and she often hangs out with Brandir because he can tell her all the names of the things in the woods. And of course, he soon falls in love with her, but she really only views him as a brother figure, which is ironic because she falls in love with her actual brother, Turin. But of course, she doesn't know he's her brother and he doesn't know she's his sister. Anyway, one evening, she and Turin are sitting together and she asks him his name. He tells her Turambar, Master of the Dark Shadow, because he ran from his own darkness just like she did. And he explains that things have been lighter and happier for him since she came to the forest. And he wonders to himself whether or not her appearance on Finduilas' grave is a sign. So a couple peaceful years go by and Turin eventually asks Neonor to marry him. But when Brandir finds out, he gets this sick feeling like something's not right. And he tells her to wait for a while on this whole marriage thing. And she's like, well, why? And he says that Turin has a shadow over him. But she replies, oh, Dorlas says he was once the greatest captain of the people of Brethiel. Come on. But Brandir says, okay, okay, that's true, but hang on. Before that, he was captain of Nargothrond. We saw what happened to that place. And he originally comes from the north. He's the son of Hurin of the warlike house of Hador. Now, she's still under Glaurung's memory spell, so she doesn't recognize those names. However, when she hears them, a shadow passes over her face. And Brandir keeps going, explaining, hey, if Turambar goes back to war, that shadow of his might have mastery over him. So this council gives her pause and she goes to Turin and asks him to postpone the wedding. And when he finds out that Brandir was the one who told her to wait, oh, he gets irritated. But whatever, another year goes by and Turin finally says to her, okay, here's the deal. If you don't marry me, I'll go off to war. But if you do, then I'll never fight again except to protect you and our home. And this deal makes her quite happy. So that midsummer, they get married and everyone is happy for them, except Brandir, who has a bad feeling about the whole thing. Section 11, the coming of Glaurung. So meanwhile, Glaurung is kind of like a king of the realm of Nargothrond. He's been gathering orcs around him and he's really been living it up with his treasure. And he's even begun to attack the land of Brethiel because he and his master know that that's where the last of the free Edain still dwell, you know, the people of Haleth. But Turin doesn't go out to battle just yet because Neonor begs him not to. But the orcs start to go deeper and deeper into the woods like never before, and Dorlas convinces Turin to do battle with them once again. So Turin takes up his black sword once more, and he and the woodmen are able to beat back the orcs for a while. Now this makes Glaurung mad, but he doesn't attack right away, instead planning out what he's going to do. And Turin decides to eventually face his doom and slay the dragon no matter what. And keep in mind, by this time, Turin is basically running the show in Brethiel. Everyone listens to him because he's the famous Black Sword, and no one listens to poor old Brandir. And what's worse is that Neonor is now pregnant, and she became pale and wan, and all her happiness was dimmed. And to top it all off, scouts come and tell Turin that Glaurung has been slowly making his way from Nargothrond towards Brethiel, burning everything in his wake. So Turin gathers all the people together and announces to them, okay, so Glaurung is coming this way. We cannot attack him head on or else he'll just kill everyone. So if he invades the forest, you guys need to scatter and flee. However, he's not unkillable. I have the black sword, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sneak up on him and stab him in his soft underbelly. But I need a couple of you to come with me. Any volunteers? <laughs> and so Dorlas, 
volunteers, of course, and a guy called Hunthor of the House of Haleth volunteers as well. Now, Brandir, of course, couldn't go even if he wanted to because of his lame leg. And even though Turing doesn't speak meanly to him, he does kind of condescendingly go on to say that since they need speed, they can't bring Brandir along. This makes Brandir really bitter. And he kind of warns Hunthor about the shadow on Turing. But no one listens to him, so whatever. <laughs> and Neonor begs Turing not to go, but he says he must and he also says, rather prophetically, neither you nor I shall be slain by this dragon, nor by any foe of the north. <laughs> well, he's not wrong about that, is he? Anyway, he and his companions set out to where Glaurung is located on the border of the river. This is at a tall, narrow gorge where the water runs fast and deep. It's called Kabed en Aras, and Turin's plan is that they wait for nightfall, climb down one side, cross the dangerous river, and go up the other side to where the dragon is, and kill him. And meanwhile, Nienor talks to Brandir to tell him how she's very apprehensive about having to just sit and wait while Turin is off facing this great danger. And she has this really deep sense of dread. She just can't handle it. So she eventually tells him, hey, I'm going to run after Turin rather than wait around to hear news of him. And Brandir's like, no. Don't do it. And she says, try and stop me. So she announces to everyone that she's going to seek Turin and the dragon. And a bunch of people actually come with her because they're, you know, they don't want to sit around either. And Brandir speaks to everyone who stayed behind. Look at this. No one listens to me. It's insulting. You know what? I renounce my lordship. Don't come crying to me when you need healing or advice. I've had it with you guys. And he decides privately, to go off and follow Neonor on his own because he's still in love with her and hopes that he might still be able to help her ward off evil. Section 12, The Death of Glaurung. So Turin is the first to climb down the cliff and cross the river. And when he looks behind him, it turns out only Hunthor crossed with him. Dorlas was too afraid of the violent thrashing of the water over the rocks below. So the two of them make their way along the water towards where Glaurung is lying up above, and then they start to climb up the cliffside. But then, suddenly, the walls of the chasm shake and echo as Glaurung wakes up and begins to heave his great body over the cliff to the brethiel side. And Turin and Hunthor rush up under him, but because the heat and the stench are so great, Turin just staggers backwards. And Hunthor catches him, only to be struck in the head and killed by a falling rock. So now Turin is alone with his enemy, who is still making his way across the ravine. He's a long dragon. It takes time. Glaurung's underbelly, by the way, is disgusting. Pale and wrinkled, and all dank with a gray slime to which clung all manner of dropping filth. And it stank of death. Then Turin draws his black sword and stabbed upwards with all the might of his arm and of his hate, and the deadly blade, long and greedy, went into the belly even to its hilts. And Glaurung shrieks and writhes around, just violently thrashing, taking Turin's sword with him, slashing and smashing everything around him until he finally falls down on the brethiel side, lying still and not moving. So with much effort, Turin goes back over the river and up the side where he originally came down, and he looked on his stricken enemy without pity and was glad. He then goes over and tries to pull the sword out, mocking Glaurung as he does so. But the dragon's black blood spurts out and burns his hand, causing him to pass out. Now, when Glaurung was screaming and dying, Neonor and everyone who followed her heard it in the distance. I mean, imagine how awful that sounded, right? And everyone is absolutely terrified because they can see the fire and believe that maybe the dragon is now coming to destroy the forest. And after hearing the scream, Neonor can't stop shaking. And this is when Brandir finds her, and he believes that, ah, oh, Turin, he must be dead by now, and that dragon is surely heading towards us. So he tries to lead Neonor away. He thinks she'll go away with him and they can be together, some such nonsense. But after a little while of walking, she says, hey, wait a minute, is this the way to Turin? 
and she gets really annoyed at him and goes off in the direction of the ravine when she realizes he's not leading her towards Turing. But of course, Brandir follows her again. And she finally finds Turin lying next to the slayed dragon, but he's really pale and cold to the touch. He looks like he's dead. And she notices his burned hand, so she washes it with her tears and binds it with a piece of her clothing. And she cries out to him, like trying to revive him, but he doesn't answer. And just then, Glaurung's body shakes one last time, and he opens his eyes and addresses Neonor by her real name. And he says, I give thee joy that thou hast found thy brother at last, a curse unto his kin, Turin, son of Hurin, and the worst of all his deeds thou shalt feel in thyself. Then he finally dies, and all of her memories flood back to her. So, oh my gosh, she is just appalled and horrified to know the truth. And Brandir was nearby this entire time, listening in on it, and he's shocked as well. And then Neonor just cries out, Farewell, O twice beloved, Aturin Turambar, Turun Nambartanen, Master of Doom, by Doom Mastered, O happy to be dead. And she starts to run, and Brandir cries out, Wait, wait! And she turns and replies, That's all you've ever said. And I should have listened to you. And now I will wait no more upon Middle Earth. And she runs to the edge of the cliff and she cries out, Water, take me and bear me down to the sea. And with that, she cast herself over the brink, a flash of white swallowed in the dark chasm, a cry lost in the roaring of the river. And Brandir is just inconsolable, but he decides to tell everyone what's happened. So he heads back to where the people are, and on the way he sees Dorlas, and he asks him what happened. Then he realizes that Dorlas is a coward who abandoned his companions. Then he basically blames Dorlas for everything that's happened, because if you remember, Dorlas was the one who originally welcomed Turin into Brethiel in the first place. And Brandir just tells him that he hates him. But Dorlas snaps back and insults him. And then he tries to hit him, but Brandir stabs and kills him. That's the first and last person he ever kills, by the way. So he runs to where the people are gathered and tells them that Neonor, Turin, and Glaurung are all dead. And he says that it's actually good that Turin is dead. And he goes on to tell them that Turin and Neonor were actually siblings. But since the people are still kind of grateful to Turin for killing the dragon, they decide to go down to the ravine and bury him. So they head towards Kabed en Aras. Section 13. The Death of Turin. Now, meanwhile, Turin has woken up with the dawn. He sees his bandage, but he's kind of confused about what happened. So he decides to go back to the fort. He approaches the place where the people still are, and they're all, of course, shocked to see him alive. And he's like, hey, everybody, what's going on? Where's Niniel? And Brandir just flatly tells him that she's dead. But Dorlas's wife cries out, Turin, he said it was a good thing you were dead, but you're alive, so why should we believe him about anything that he says? And now Turin is getting angry, and he turns to Brandir and says, You said it was good that I was dead? What lies are you telling, Clubfoot? And Brandir is livid, screaming. She jumped into the river because she was your sister, you sicko! And then Turin grabs him and shakes him. No way! My sister's in Doriath safe and sound. You're crazy! And Brandir quotes to him Glaurung's dying words. And when Turin threatens to kill him, Brandir simply says that if he does, then he'll just be proving the dragon right. And of course, Turin lets him go. I'm just kidding. He kills him. And then he flees into the woods, cursing basically everything and everyone. And he's really trying to convince himself that Neonor is safe in Doriath. So he decides to go there and prove himself correct. But just then, he sees a party of elves approach the crossings of Teglin. And they're being led by Mablung, who is really happy to see Turin alive. And Mablung tells him that he was looking for him to help him fight the dragon, but Turin just asks him about his mother and sister. And Mablung explains everything that happened up until Neonor ran away from him and the other elves when the orcs were chasing her. 
And this, of course, is definitive proof for Turin, and he becomes crazed and runs away from them like the wind. And they figure there's something more to this story that they don't know that he knows. So they follow him to see if they can help or do something. But Turin runs back to Kabed and Aras and finds his sword lying on the ground. So he picks it up and asks it if it will kill him. And the sword actually talks to him, replying that it will gladly do so. So he puts the hilt on the ground and casts himself onto its point. And it kills him instantly, and then it breaks beneath him. And the elves finally arrive on the scene, and they are so grieved to see him dead. And when the rest of the people of Brethiel come and see everything too, they explain to the elves the whole story of how he married Neonor and all of that. And of course, they're just aghast. But soon everyone comes together, they lament the deaths, they burn Glaurung's body, and they bury Turin under a giant mound along with the shards of his sword. The elves then erect a gravestone with the words Turin Turambar Dagnir Glaurunga, which means Turin Master of Fate, Glaurung's Bane. And underneath they write Nienor Niniel. Thus ends the tale of the children of Hurin the longest of all the lays of Beleriand.